sin. When I first heard of the religion, I must my dad be sad. Because to be fat is an animal which you take care of, lives with you, you play with it. Well, actually, as we all clinicians do, we always like to use short form. So the PET in fact actually is composition emission tomography, which is an imaging technique which has The keyword there is sub centers, meaning not Malaysia. Between this and the other, which occur in this area, because it uses radio nuclide, and this radio nuclide is actually tagged to glucose. The reasoning being that abnormal areas. Very active, it uses up glucose. So, uh, what you do is you look at these areas in a certain manner using certain machines, and this area will uh, be what we call a highly lighted area. It shows more heat than the machine. Why are we using PET scan in cervical cancer? You have to look at the initial part of the management. One, you have to diagnose, and we would like a histopathological diagnosis. You do not diagnose cervical based on cytology alone. Then we have to stage the patient. So that's partially where the PET scan comes in as part of the imaging component. In the olden days when radiology facilities were not so good, we actually just did an IVU, intravenous urogram. Then we progress to CT scan, MRI, and perhaps PET scan is the latest thing that should be used. Of course, you have your clinical part of the staging. One still needs to do an examination under anesthesia, cystoscopy. You may even need to do a hysteroscopy if you're not sure whether the cancer is actually from the cervix or from the uterus. And you may even need to do a proctoscopy if you think that there is some rectal invasion involved. So the other day, some but he was asking me, if you have all this radiological facility, why do you still need to do clinical staging? And I feel that we still need to because not all of us are experts. And if you don't do EUA, how are the junior gynecologists are learning to know what does the parametric thickness feels like and how to assess properly? So in that sense, EUA is not just for the patient, it's also partially as a teaching process for all the junior gynecologies. Then look at the medical assessment. Why? If you go by the book, you will say that anything from stage 2A upwards can go for Right? How come nobody is answering? Can you operate somebody with stage 1B2? Still nobody wants to answer. I think everyone is asleep already. Okay. But you have to look at the patient as a whole. If your patient has congestive cardiac failure, can't even lie flat for one hour, would you actually want to put up the patient for extended uh, radical hysterectomy? Even though the stage is 1D2, you may not. You may actually just go for radiotherapy straight away. So in that sense, there is never a certain uh, way of treating the patient. You must assess the patient as a whole. And then only we will plan the primary treatment and don't forget that counselling is very important. Not just for the family but the family members as well. This is one of the things that Prof. Tate taught me also. Then, after you've done what you're supposed to do, the patient has received the primary treatment, you're supposed to do the follow-up and surveillance. Again, one factor is clinical. We do the vaginal examination, rectal examination, whole body examination, look for lymph nodes and things like that which may suggest recurrence. Then, in certain patients which we are afraid may have recurrence, either because there are clinical findings or because we know that this patient probably is a bit more high risk, we think of doing imaging uh, investigation such as CT, MRI or the gate PET scan may come in. So what 
does PET scan do? Look at the previous uh, imaging techniques first. So, you do CT and MRI previously. This is something which most of us are probably a bit more familiar. CT scan, okay, if you remember, PET scan has been in use somewhere in the mid 1990s. So, CT scan comes earlier, about 15 years before that. And in addition to the lymph nodes, the pelvic and abdominal CT scan also allows you to look at the liver, urinary tract, and even bony structures. So it can detect changes in the size of the nodes, but only if they are bigger than one centimeter. So you may have a microscopic deposits less than one centimeter, in which case the radiologist may report that there's no enlarged nodes, or you may have an inflamed nodes which are bigger and may be reported as possible metastasis. So these are the problems sometimes that you have with CT scan. So somewhere along the way, MRI was explored. Um, the main advantage of having MRI is that it has a high contrast resolution and multi-planar imaging capability. So this is a valuable modality, especially if you're looking at soft tissue problems. You can actually look at the soft tissue better, the degree of stromal penetration, the vaginal extension, the extension to the parametrium, and lymph node status. And MRI uh, was uh, evaluated sometimes a bit later, about five years after the CT scan has been started to be used. So, I hope the pointer is working. All right. So in this study in 1995, they say that if you compare CT scan and MRI, there is a 90% accuracy. By contrast, CT scan for evaluation of stage of disease, MRI has an accuracy of 90% compared to 65%. So that's a significant change. In assessing parametric invasion, again, there's a significant difference between CT scan and MRI. However, if you look at lymph node metastasis, both were actually compatible. So in this study by Wagner, it's mentioned that because of this ability to more accurately determine tumor diameter, parametric infiltration, especially in patients with bulky cervical tumors, it is a useful adjunct to clinical evaluation. So, uh, in fact, as a routine in Singapore now, they use a CT thorax and abdomen and MRI of the pelvis to assess. And you don't just look at the size of the tumor, you actually calculate volume because that helps to prognosticate. So, then comes this new kit on the block, the PET scan. So, this detects abnormalities of metabolism. As I mentioned, it looks at glucose utilization. And how do we get these hot spots? They are given IV glucose, which have been packed with radioactive material. And they can even detect smaller cancer areas, less than one centimeter. However, if the cancer cells are a bit low, it is still not possible to detect. So, PET scan is not 100% accurate still. And there's two components. You need to have a machine. Actually, the machine is still a CT scan machine. And you need to have the radionuclide component. But in this machine, you can actually rotate the images of the patient. You can look front, back, side. And you can actually see the tumor better in terms of looking at the heat areas, the hot areas. I hope, yeah, it looks quite well on the screen. So this is a patient, 43 year old, with invasive squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. Not in Malaysia. I saw this through the internet. So uh, according to the findings, this patient has ritual peritoneal and left supraclavicular fossa lymph nodes. There, and there is also some problems in the ritual peritoneal area, more so on the left side of the ureter. Uh, please note that there's also this hot spot here. That's the stomach. Because of the, all the metabolism, all the digestion that is going on, usually uh, the PET scan will pick this up. And also if the patient is breastfeeding, then that also will show up as key areas. So that's how when you send a patient for PET scan, you have to inform 
if this patient breastfeeding, or there are assisted questionnaires that you have to fill up. So, uh, PET scan is helpful because they can be used both in initial staging and also as surveillance and monitoring. After the pr primary operation, or because of radiotherapy or chemotherapy, you can have a distortion of the anatomy. It can be scarred and fibrous, which is the basic weakness in CT and MRI in surveillance. And the second problem is small tumor size, which may not be picked up by the CT scan and MRI. So how good is it? This uh, article was published in 2002. It actually looks at 419 studies with about 18,000 patients. So their finding is that the sensitivity actually ranges from 84 to 87% with a specificity of 88 to 93% and the accuracy is around 87 to 90%. <coughs> And uh, this is again another study in 2001. They look at 101 patients who are newly diagnosed with cervical cancer. So out of this 100, the PET scan is able to identify 100 patients. Did they only miss one? So it's a 99.1%, whereas the CT scan can only identify 77 cases. In terms of lymph node, for pelvic lymph nodes, PET scan identified 67, whereas CT scan only found 20. And abdominal is uh, 20, 21 patients, and CT scan is one third of them. And in abnormal supraclavicular area, there, there are 8 patients who are identified on PET scan, which was totally missed by the CT scan. And all the problems that were detected by CT scan were also detected on PET scan. So it looks like it's much, much superior. Just to tell you all that by afternoon, the lectures will be over and you can go and look at Langkawi. This is a bit worthy. So this is a summary of all that 500 plus. Okay, thank you for the bell. So, um, they actually look at not just uterine and pelvic cancer, also at ovarian. And there are comparisons either with CT scan or with uh, the other things like laparoscopic histology, laparotomy. These are the gold standard in comparing. And the purpose of the study is also seen. Is it for staging? Is it for diagnosis? Or is it for follow-up? So, out of these 8,402 patients, if you can see here, for ovary, uterine, and cervix, comparison is more between PET scan and uh, CT scan. And this is how we got the accuracy, the sensitivity, and the specificity as mentioned previously. Okay, I need to discuss a bit. So, both in uh, initial staging process and post-treatment, there are various areas that needs evaluation. And that's the problem. There is never one perfect modality which can look at all. Even if you talk about tumour, you have to look at the tumour size and volume, the tissue invasion, site of metastasis. Even if you're looking at something which can pick up node metastasis, you have to specify which node. Is it pelvic nodes? Is it abdominal? Is it supraclavicular? And all these studies is unable to give one complete answer. There's always a clause. This only looks at pelvic nodes. This only looks at parametrium. So you cannot find a single study which says that this modality is superior in everything. So, most studies also only compare PET scan with CT scan. I cannot find anything which compare PET scan with MRI. Perhaps because PET scan is a comprise of CT scan plus the radionuclide. Uh, modality, so that's why the comparison is easier, and also because MRI is more expensive. So, if all modalities are available, CT scan appears to have the least accuracy. Cost wise, and in terms of availability, however, CT scan is easier and faster to get and cheaper. You can get it in most major hospitals now. PET scan, government hospital, is only in Penang and Putrajaya, and waiting list is up to six weeks. 
And if you were to send a patient, they still have to pay 500 ringgit, even though the rest of it is subsidized. I asked Daniel, he said in uh, Johor, the private hospitals are charging about four, three to 4,000 for one PET scan. And in Singapore, according to PROM, it's about 2,000 sing dollar, so not Malaysian ringgit. Eh? Whereas for a CT scan, even if you were to go and have it done in private, uh, could, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Adan, because Dr. Adan is our senior gynecologist from IPO. According to IPO Specialist Hospital, for a CT scan at Derman and Pelvis costs about 830 ringgit. Uh, if you add a thoracic view to it, it costs you another 450, so that's what 1,000. Uh, 280, whereas an MRI of the pelvis costs about 720 ringgit, but that is EPO, so it may be more expensive in Penang or KL. Whereas in government hospital, you do it for free. See the difference? So in conclusion, I would say that PET scan, yes, it is superior when it comes to evaluating cervical cancer patients, both new cases or those who are post treatment. It is however expensive, it's not easily available, and currently not suitable for need, patients who need immediate decision making. If I have a patient who has cervical cancer and I have to wait six weeks for the PET scan appointment, and probably another two or three weeks for PNAC to post the results back to me, that is not good enough. Two months plus have been wasted. So some centers are doing CT thorax and abdomen with MRI of the pelvis as a way of increasing tumor detection and improving the staging or surveillance process. So perhaps that's what we can do. And in my hospital, radiology says yes. If you want to, especially in your follow-up cases, we will try to adjust the MRI for you, but only in selected cases. So not every discipline will get MRI done in government hospital. So at the end of the day, looking at all this, you can't really say that PET scan is suited for everyone. So in the end, when you want to manage your patient, it's up to you, the skills, the experience, and at times what we call the gut feeling that will decide the best management. So these are some of the references, and these are all the cute pets that does not need a scan. Anybody wants to take them home? No, I don't have them in my hotel room. Eh? Please don't report to the manager. So thank you for your attention and just to remind you that Langkawi also has its cable car. So if you're not afraid of heights, please go and tackle them today. Thank you for your attention.